watching. Thank you for being online and taking interest in this topic. Really glad to have you with us. And since this meeting is not a hearing, members of the public are going to be able to observe but won't be able to offer testimony today. We're hoping Maybe the issue. I think you have to. I hadn't uh, turned it on. Closer to them. There we go. I hadn't turned it on. It I apologize for that. Huh? Does so, it work? Can I talk from here? I think you should use this mic. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Just because there's people. Is there a way to put that mic here? Sarah, I think you just have to speak closer to the mic. I think you just have to have the mic closer to you. Well, um. I can take that mic. Question, let's see. I don't, I don't think, think so. So I mean it's stuck here. Okay. So the people in the room can hear, right? So it's it's the, the issue is that the interpreter isn't able to hear. Is that the problem? You can't hear in the back of the room? Okay. Okay. What if you sat? Yeah. Is someone able to click for me and I'll just um, Yes, sure. I can okay. do it for you. Great. Thank you. Sure, sorry. <laughs> Got all my notes. Yeah, you can just sit. No worries. Here. Okay. Okay. Can you all hear me okay now? You just have to talk a little closer. Closer, what about now? There we go. Okay, um, I'm just gonna move your stuff here, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here. My name is Melissa Appleton. I am the program director at the Participatory Budgeting Project. Um, and I just, 
a lot of the folks in this room, including a lot of you all, have experience with PB. And so I just want to recognize that and ask if you know that your city council district does PB or not, if you know, could you just put your hand up so I get a sense? Okay. And if you have ever participated in the PB process in the city, could you put your hand up? Okay. And if you ever were involved with the citywide leadership on the steering committee or setting up the process in the beginning, could you raise your hand? Okay. You're working. So that's super helpful. Um, you can switch to the next one. Uh, as Sarah said, the Participatory Budgeting Project is a nonprofit organization. We help empower communities to directly decide how to spend public funds. We do this across the U.S. and Canada and have been involved with PB in New York since its inception. Um, so, uh, next slide please. <laughs> Um, I have 10 minutes to cover a ton of information, so hopefully this is just the start of the conversation, and um, we're happy to be a resource, as are many of the folks who raise their hands and have knowledge on the subject. So this is what we're going to cover in 10 minutes. What is PB? Um, what's happened in New York City up until this point? What have the successes and impacts been? And how do you consider expanding the process citywide so that we can replicate those successes and avoid any um, challenges or obstacles. So uh, just to set the stage, we know that we're here having this conversation because participation historically has not worked for communities, right? It's been painful, it's been unequal, um, and often leads to increased disillusionment and a sense of powerlessness. So PB is a process that we believe um, can redesign democracy so that it works for people and that it's participant-centered, right? It's based on the expertise of the people living in the community uh, who it is intended to serve. It's democracy centered on participants. So most of you have a handout um, that has the same graphic on it, uh, but just so everyone's on the same page, the process is cyclical, right? It's an iterative process, meaning we're experimenting with democracy and always trying to make it better. It starts with community members designing the process, how it works, how they're gonna engage the community they're trying to connect with, um, having the entire community brainstorm ideas for community improvements. Volunteers here, they're called budget delegates. I move on that. Oh, yeah, go back. Um, work in collaboration with city, with agencies, uh, with experts to develop concrete, feasible proposals for a ballot that go up to the community for a vote, and the community decides what actually gets funded, right? The projects that win the most votes win. And then it starts again. Um, I wanted to, good morning, wanted to share that PB is happening all over the world, right? So we're part of a broader movement for this kind of participatory democracy. It's happened at every level of government that you can really think of. Um, it's happened in the global north, the global south. Um, it does not come from North America. The idea comes from Brazil. Do you want me to? If you want to come up, I think the mic is. It's up to you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Excuse us. Yay. Switch. So, um, <laughs> in North America, you can hear me okay? Okay. In North America, um, our organization helped bring participatory budgeting first to Chicago after it had been in Toronto. Toronto is the first process in North America in public housing for public housing residents. Uh, it came to Chicago. Uh, then we helped with partners like Community Voices Heard bring it to four council members here in New York City. And we are now entering the ninth cycle officially of the city council process, which some of you work with directly. Um, and while it started with four, four districts, it's really expanded. PB at the same time is expanding all across North America. So it's spread really rapidly. We have this map on our website, which is participatorybudgeting.org. It's hard to even keep track of the data. There's so much happening. So in New York City, um, 
This is the largest process in North America to date. It's in about half of city council right now, where council members voluntarily opt in to give control of a portion of their discretionary capital funds to their local district community. Um, it's supported centrally by the speaker's office, and um, it's primarily been capital. However, PB is not restricted to capital. That's really important to think about. Um, it has been expanding in a few districts to the discretionary expense funds, and in places outside of New York, it happens with all sorts of programmatic budgets. Um, so there's different ways to meet the needs of the community. Um, one of the things I'll talk about is how uh, this process can collaborate with City Council and have a multi-level process in the city so it's not a competition and so it's really easy for residents to participate. At the same time, I do want to flag that in New York, PB is expanding in schools. So the mayor announced um, a new initiative, Civics for All, which is bringing PB to every high school, every public high school in New York City. They started this past year with, I believe, 47 or 48 high schools. Um, this was from one of them, uh, the picture on the right, the Manhattan International High School. I attended their vote. Um, the picture on the left is from a local elementary school, so other schools are doing this as well. And some of the CUNY colleges, the City University of New York campuses, are doing PB, and there's a group of students and faculty advocating for a process across the entire CUNY um, uh, university. So here's what we've seen, right? This is based on research over many years. Um, PB broadens political participation. And we know this for simple reasons, like the fact that you don't need to be a citizen to vote. You can be uh, a young person. You don't have to be a voting age to vote. Uh, you could be previously involved or currently involved in the justice system and vote. Um, so it broadens participation that way, and research has shown that it um, engages more low-income people and people of color than in traditional elections. Just a few more um, statistics from 2015. Uh, research and evaluation is something to consider how you assess the impacts of the process, and so we're hopeful that there will be some more data as this expands. Um, PB also develops new community leaders. We really see it as part of the leadership pipeline. I know the commission is going to be engaging with community boards, for example. There can be a lot of ways that this can um, be mutually supporting. And um, we've had participants report that they've increased their sense of confidence, they've increased public speaking skills, they've learned about how government works and have been able to advocate successfully for funding even beyond from the PB pot that they were originally working with. We also have participants report higher trust in government, right? When government asks them what they want and they get to see that their decision is what happens, um, it makes a difference. It's different than a typical input process or a typical feedback process. Um, and the other thing we, we like to see in PB is that it strengthens relationships by well, of neighbors, right, and community members. I participated in my own council districts process. I met people I never would have met in my community that I'm still in touch with. So that was true for me. Um, lastly, we see that there's more equitable and effect uh, effective spending as a result of participatory budgeting. Two things I'll flag is that this is a process that has and can have explicit equity-based criteria, right? So when you're researching the projects to go on the ballot, we can frame what those projects look like. We can frame in advance what's eligible to be funded based on what the needs of the community are. Um, and the other thing we've seen is that through participatory budgeting, often community needs are raised that government wouldn't have known about. And we've seen this at all levels. We have examples from schools where students asked for things that the school district never knew was an issue. 
so how do you do this, right? Because it's not just saying it that'll make it happen, it's how you set it up. And so these are the things that our organization, the Participatory Budgeting Project, has identified as really critical in setting up a participatory budgeting process for success and for those impacts that we wanna keep building on. So money that matters. We're talking about money that feels significant to communities and money that's gonna impact community needs of the community we wanna reach, right? So if you're, um, if you're looking to engage with an underrepresented or marginalized community, work with a budget that's gonna be meaningful to their lives. Oops. Um, second, <laughs> grassroots leadership um, as a participatory process it has to practice what it preaches, right? It has to be based on the wisdom of the community it's trying to serve. Um, and as I mentioned in this room, there's a ton of experience here, so we want to be able to support that with continued grassroots leadership um, and having the community design the process. So being able to say, this is how you reach this community. This is what's gonna work. This is what's not gonna work, right? Um, inclusive design, bringing the process to people where they're at, not forcing them to come to us, not a hearing like this, but going out to the streets, going to schools, going to um, houses of worship, going to supermarkets and laundromats, right? Trying to make the process as physically accessible, accessible to all languages. I know there's gonna be a presentation on language access, and this is very connected to that issue. Um, so inclusive design, focused outreach, despite all our efforts, efforts, we know that we're gonna have to make a special effort to engage certain communities that we want to participate. You all know that. Um, it's an investment that we think is worthwhile, which has in the past looked like funding local community groups to do outreach to their networks and to their community. And the last one is those equity criteria, right? Having the grassroots leadership, having you all help shape in advance who you're trying to reach and what can be funded so the projects affect the folks who most need the funds. So, y'all with me still? It's a lot of information. Okay. Um, for you all in the commission, we've been thinking a lot with partner organizations uh, for many years uh, about how you expand this in the city successfully. And these are some of the core questions that we think you will need to have answers for, right? You'll be discussing this. Key one, what funding is gonna be allocated? How will we support the process on the back end and what kind of infrastructure and systems are necessary to make sure it's successful? Um, given that there already is PB in New York City, how does this interact with existing processes, both the council and the DOE potentially um, levels? And lastly, how do we ensure we're following best practices, not only from New York, but from around the world, and meeting the needs of city residents? So those are the four key questions that I think uh, you'll be discussing. And we do have some recommendations. So I believe you've already received folks on the commission. There's a proposal for citywide participatory budgeting that is part of a full recommendations um, package that came from a group of stakeholders um, working on different topics related to this work of civic engagement. Um, so within that, these are the things we think are the top priorities to set up citywide participatory budgeting for success, right? Meaningful PB funding. Our recommendation is at least $500 million. <laughs> um, a process needs to be meaningful for it to be significant, for it to matter to people and to have the impacts we wanna see. Um, there's a lot of different types of budgets that could be used. We again wanna move away from just capital. Um, two, it needs an investment in staff. It needs an investment in working with the nonprofit partners on the ground. And it also needs a way to make it easy for folks to participate, um, likely through some form of digital platform, right? In, uh, to add on to the in-person engagement that's fundamental in the process. We think there's ways to consolidate and coordinate with the civic engagement programs across the city. Again, so nothing is in uh, competition so that it's easy for a resident to share an idea and have it go someplace and to know how to participate, right? We wanna make it easy. 
And the last piece is again supporting an empowered PB advisory committee. Um, there are models for this from around the world, from the work we've been doing in North America and here in New York that we can build on, um, but it's fundamental for um, public perception of the process, for it to be community-led, and to ensure that you're really set up for success and building on the knowledge and expertise of the community. So, I will stop there, and maybe we have a couple minutes for yeah, questions. We can take a couple of questions. Yeah. The digital participation, has other countries or cities have already used any type of digital platform? Yeah, so here in New York City, there's a way to submit an idea online. For city council, there's a way to vote online. They aren't integrated. And so what we're looking at is other cities that have more integrated platforms where you can do all of this in one place. Um, and on the back end, there's a lot of details on the implementation side of collecting the data. That would be very helpful if it was integrated. So yes, there are models from around the world to, to consider. Um, your first question is allocate meaningful PV funding. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you're referring to what the administration side will allocate for projects or for the, on the flip side, what that would look like for uh, actual PV infrastructure support. The first one is about the pot of funds that are that's going to be uh, identified, I guess, by the administration for allocation by the community. Yeah. So other leading processes, um, Paris as an example, in Paris you can vote as a resident on school projects, on local neighborhood projects, and citywide projects all in one place. I believe they have a, an online platform to do that. Um, and I brought a couple of copies. This is now old and outdated. Um, but an example of their ballot from 2016. And if I look on the first page, one of the projects costs 8.3 million euros. So just to give you an example of scale. And I can pass this around. Yeah, yeah. Um, I appreciate all of it, and especially um, point three. Uh, I'm wondering if um, we currently have, um, has anybody done an inventory or audit on all of the engagement programs across the city? I mean, that, that seems rather daunting to me, so I'm yeah. Do you want to speak to that? Do you want me to answer that? I, I, you, you're welcome to answer whatever you want. <laughs> um, so this is a topic that's come up. Um, I had a meeting with folks in the Department of Health this week, and that was the key takeaway of that meeting, was they wish there was a, a resource that showed all the different forms of civic engagement in city agencies, and then identified best practices. For this, we're talking specifically about citywide PB, because that's, that's my area of expertise. Um, so looking at how citywide PB can partner with or happen in parallel to existing PB processes. So since it will be continuing at the city council district level, not doing a process that would make it harder for people to then participate in both. So I think we had talked, just to jump in fairly quickly, we started to talk a little bit about trying to map out some of what's going on, but we can yeah, because it's clearly a need. I mean, I think that we don't want to duplicate efforts. Mm -hmm. We want to work with people who are already doing stuff. To do that, we need to know what's going on. So, yeah. Yeah. question. Um, so, do you have any thoughts about how to um, balance or reconcile the need to keep it community-led, you know, and I think that's been a strong point of emphasis in your presentation, but also to centralize and consolidate some of the support, the back-end support? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> um, I think partly it goes to ensuring that there is always an in-person component to this process and that that in-person component is supported, right? With staffing, with, um, with promotion, right? With communications and designers and social media and with local nonprofits that work with the communities we're most trying to reach. 
that work needs to be funded, right? We're not, we can't ask people to, to volunteer their time just because we think it's an important cause. Um, so that's, I think, one way to do it. And a lot of the back-end support is designed, ideally, to streamline that, to make it easier to collect large amounts of data in person and have it centralized and maintained online. That's an example. Any other questions? Okay, this is just the beginning of the PB journey. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here and your time. Okay, um, we now have two other presentations. So um, we're going to first invite Nisha Agarwal. Do you have a PowerPoint, Nisha? Yeah. Okay. Um, who is a senior advisor with Democracy NYC? Um, who will do you maybe just is that okay? Yeah. Or do you want to sit? Yeah, okay. Um, and then after that, we'll have Anne do her presentation. So, hi everyone. Um, there's been a soccer. <laughs> activities going on there. <laughs> that was very exciting. It's still going on. Um, but here we're ta talking about something else that's also very exciting, which is democracy. So I wanted to say, first of all, um, thank you to Sa Sarah Zaid for being here and to all of the commissioners for joining. Um, this is really very exciting to watch um, the CEC becoming a thing. <laughs> That's great. So I'm Misha Agarwal. I'm a senior advisor at City Hall, and I'm focused on democracy. And what does that mean? Well, it means voting. But it means a whole bunch of other things. Community boards, participatory budgeting, running for office. We want to help people get voting and lots of other things um, on that. Why does it matter? So I'll give you some data. For people with disabilities, half of them don't vote. They don't register half of the people that are possible. That's significantly lower than the average. Immigrant groups, you look at Asians, for example, only 40% are registered. 60% are not registered. So all of this information, many of you are on that, uh, in that kind of work, um, are impacted by voting. So that's the, the stats. Um, personally, for me, I cared, two years ago, I really cared a lot about my health care. I cared about my taxes. Sadly, we lost. But all of these decisions are by the president, by the mayor, by the governor. We need to know all of that information is very important to what is happening by voting and civic engagement. So I want to give you an example of some of the stuff that we've been doing at City Hall and uh, in the city. So one is early voting. Um, many of you must know that now for the elections, the uh, uh, general elections, we're now going to be able to have 10 days to vote, not just one. So if you have a child who's sick on that day, you have to work t two days that day. Um, you can come by and go in a different day. However, so this is very great for lots of people in the city, um, but there are challenges. So they have, we've been work closely working with the Board of Elections, and initially they had only 36 sites. 36 out of more than 5 million registered New Yorkers is paltry. Um, it didn't impact in key areas like Harlem. They didn't have those kinds of areas. So we've been working with advocates on this. We've been uh, writing letters. We've been going to the BOE regularly. Um, the mayor announced a, a hundred sites at least, and he promised to give them $73 million to do this. 
So what did they respond positively? They increased it by over 50. Still not close to, to 100, but we're, we're working hard and we're working with advocacy groups and others. So that's an example of the kind of work that we're been, we've been doing on um, voting and civic engagement. And you guys, the Civic Engagement Commission, is like that too. And we're really excited to work with you and to find out um, what you might do in the future. Um, we have, there are 15, um, 15 uh, commissioners, all of you, and we are so happy to see that people with disabilities, people with immigrant backgrounds, uh, all over, the, it's like a, a, a microcosm of the city, and I'm really excited to continue to work with you and um, work with voting and civic engagement in general. And um, one of the issues that we care about a lot, and you're going to hear more from Moya on this, is interpretation and how do we make that even better. So that's just a, a, a snapshot of what we're going to work on, but we're really looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Do you know if they started choosing the new sites for the early voting yet? Well, um, so they do. We know the 57 sites. Um, they haven't made an, a public announcement yet, but they will new know that soon. We're trying to still add more to because it's still not, 50 still is not enough. So we're working on that. Yeah, keep me posted on that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Our nonprofit was selected as one of them. Oh good. Oh good. Thank you. And if any of you all have that kind of like space, think about that. Like Harlem is very important. So great. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Anne. Montesano, Executive Director of Interagency Initiatives and Language Access for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Uh, Moya has been piloting a methodology for pull site interpretation, so they'll tell us a little bit about what's been happening. Um, the Civic Engagement Commission will be getting more involved in this process. As you know, we need to put forward a methodology for public review that is due in January. It has to be online for at least 30 days for the public to comment. We need to then revise it and you know, have a final version of that methodology. In the meantime, we'll also be working with Moya and operations to start to take over the whole site interpretation program, and so we'll be getting involved in that for this uh, this coming general election as well. So again, to give you more context about what's been going on, what we'll be building off of for the Civic Engagement Commission's work. I just want to make this, good morning everyone, I just want to make this a full screen. It's, up, it's full on there. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anne Montesano, and I am the Executive Director of Interagency Initiatives and Language Access at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. It's great to be here with you all today. One of the projects uh, that I've worked very closely on these past few, few years and have overseen is the Pulse Site Interpretation Project. And um, we, Moya, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, launched this project in 2017, and it's really been an extension of both our language access work to help limited English proficient voters exercise their right to vote, as well as an extension of some of the civic engagement work that Moya has been involved in, such as the translation of voter registration forms. We've worked really closely with Democracy NYC and with the Mayor's Office of Operations, and it's really exciting that this work is being institutionalized within the Civic Engagement Commission. We've laid a lot of groundwork over the past few years, and I'll sort of walk you through some of that groundwork and what we've did, what we've done on the on the last few elections. 
So we started in 2017, and this was a pilot project. So we looked at census data to determine what languages uh, the limited English, the potentially eligible limited English proficient voters spoke, uh, the highest concentrations of those languages beyond the languages in which the Board of Elections provides interpretation services in, right? So our goal was to provide supplemental interpretation services to LEP, limited English proficient voters. And looking at the census data, we saw that Russian and Haitian Creole speakers have the highest number of, the, those languages have the highest numbers of potentially eligible LEP voters. So we honed in on those two language groups. Um, and then looking at the data determined that Brooklyn was the borough with the highest number and there were two community districts in particular with the highest number of Russian and Haitian Creole voters. So we selected 20 poll sites and provided Russian or Haitian Creole interpreters. We hired a vendor to screen interpreters. We trained those interpreters and they were stationed at 20 sites across Brooklyn. We were stationed outside, 101 feet outside, and that changed, as I'll describe in other, in subsequent elections. Um, but it was the first pilot, we served a number of voters, and then for the November 2018 general election, we really scaled up. So we, quintu we quintupled the number of sites we were at to 101. We again looked at the census data, we wanted to expand the number of languages that we provided interpretation in, and so the top six languages with the the highest number of potentially eligible LEP voters per poll site were these six languages, Russian, Haitian, Creole, Yiddish, Polish, Italian, and Arabic. Um, primarily, again, in Brooklyn, that's where the data indicates, but also we had a few sites in Queens and, and a site in Staten Island. Um, we were also outside. Interpreters had, you know, pins. We had tablecloths that said interpretation available, signage. Um, and then the February, we had a number of special elections this year that we provided interpreters in. We provided interpretation at 48 sites in Russian, Haitian, Creole, Yiddish, and Polish, in Brooklyn and Queens. The May special was a little different. It was Council District 45, Jamani Williams, Old District. And so there were three sites there that, that um, had large concentrations of Haitian Creole voters. So we provided Haitian Creole interpretation at three sites. These special elections in 2019, we were able to be stationed inside, outside of the polling room, but inside the facility, the polling, you know, buildings, which was, which was really great. Um, so a bit about our interpreters. Um, so like I said before, we contracted with a vendor to hire interpreters. So they did the recruitment, the screening, the hiring. Um, and their role was to obviously provide interpretation between the poll worker, the voter, to um, be stationed at their table and to answer questions that voters have about the voting process to accompany voters, LEP voters inside when requested, to um, orally translate the ballot, orally translate any signage or materials, and interpreters were trained. So we, in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Operations, conducted a training to these poll site interpreters so that they were very clear on their role. This, this training was based off of the BOE's training manual for their interpreters. It focuses on the role of the interpreter, prohibition against electioneering, the nonpartisan nature of this project. Um, it focused on the voting process um, so that they, were, they could be familiar with the stages and steps that voters need to take in order to, to vote, um, as well as election day operations, right? There's a lot of logistics involved with an operation like this. So telling them kind of what time they needed to arrive, um, who their su supervisors would be, uh, how, how to contact their supervisors in case there are any issues. So 
what is what are sort of some of the, the accomplishments of these last few years of doing these elections? So we think we've we've left um, quite a good infrastructure and laid a lot of good groundwork. We're excited that the CEC will be will be eventually taking over this work. Um, what we've done is we've served over 2,800 limited English proficient voters in the elections that we've provided interpretation in. That doesn't in include the June numbers yet. We have now a pool of interpreters. So we've worked with a vendor and we have interpreters who have served in multiple elections. So they know the drill. They understand this project. They've done this work before. And we've laid this infrastructure. So we've developed a training. We've developed protocol documents. We've really refined the election day operations so that they're smooth. The sort of staffing structure that needs to um, facilitate a smooth operation for the for the ground operation on election day. So, you know, in closing, we've done a lot of work these past few years. We're really excited that this work will become institutionalized in the city and look forward to working with the CEC to continue it. So, and you can ask questions. Um, all right. Donna Gill. My question to you is how did you find the synergy between your interpreters and the BO, the Board of Elections? Because I know that can be, I wanted to know, a little contentious with just not knowing protocol and things like that. Yeah. So how was that? Yep. So. So a few things. Our operation was separate from the Board of Elections operation. So we did not, the Board of Elections is required to provide interpreters in particular languages per the Voting Rights Act. The languages we were providing interpretation in were supplemental to that, right? So we, we excluded the language that the Board of Elections provides interpretation in and looked at the census data to determine what are the other top languages. And then because our operation was separate, we were, we were not part of theirs. So we we were outside of the polling room the first couple of elections. Um, we were out. We, we had to be outside, 101 feet away. There is litigation um, that's ongoing now, but we were permitted to be uh, inside the last few elections. Okay. Be because I'm sorry. The, the reason I'm asking is because the part in which the interpreter can go in. Yes. So that becomes a bone of contention with the Board of Elections. So interpreters are permitted to go inside and even inside the voting booth mm -hmm. um, in addition to the room. So our interpreters were permitted to go inside. They were stationed outside of the polling room, Area. but they, if the voter wanted their assistance, they were permitted to go inside and accompany the voter through the process. And that went ramp Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You're asking a question as someone who has worked at the poll. Yes, exactly. Oh, <laughs> so, yes. okay, good to know. Someone that works at the poll yeah. every election. So. Yeah. Hey, um, what was the parameters used to select the locations to provide translation services in addition to whatever the BOE was providing? So census data, and then we focused on the languages that had the highest concentrations of potentially eligible LEP voters per poll site. So we were going to the poll sites with the highest needs in those languages. Was it layered with ACS data? Yeah. Um, so I'm just confused then a bit of how there was only one Arabic site in Brooklyn that was in Gravesend as opposed to Bay Ridge, uh, which has the largest Arab population, uh, as well as Astoria and a couple other parts of the, yep. of the city, like Sam West Bronx. Sam Solomon from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs is coming up. He worked closely on the methodology. Yeah, and thanks for the question. Um, the process that we used to select the both the languages and the poll sites where we deployed the interpreters was, as you said, Murad, based on American Community Survey census data. Um, it involves a number of steps, which I'm also happy to describe to you all um, in order to sort of focus that data at the very local levels by poll site that we were working on. Um, the 101 sites that we've worked at, um, at the largest iteration of this project, as Anne described, um, included six different languages 
languages. Um, and as you said, Murad, quite rightly, that it included one site in Arabic um, in Brooklyn, um, as well as a number of sites in, in the five other languages as well. Um, what we've done in order to come to that conclusion about where the 101 sites and what languages they encompassed was that we created effectively a ranking of every single poll site that the Board of Elections was operating and including uh, all of the different languages that we estimate based on the census data are represented by the potentially eligible limited English proficient voters who live within the jurisdictions of those poll sites. What we discovered through that process, and, um, and I will emphasize that this really truly was a fully data-driven process that we did, and it's a fully transparent. We've actually described it in court documents, um, which, as I mentioned, I can describe further here. Um, what we saw through that process is that when you rank the poll sites, what you get is a, a number of poll sites who fell that fell within the top 101 where you saw very concentrated populations within those poll site jurisdictions. As you work your way further down the list, what you encounter are some of the other sites that I think you're referring to, Murad, in, for instance, in Bay Ridge or Astoria or other locations, um, including in other boroughs too, where you see smaller concentrations within those individual poll sites however, significant concentrations within like a group of poll sites that are within, in, in a particular region. So if you were to look at Bay Ridge as a whole, or Astoria, for instance, which are great examples, you will see a large number of, for instance, Arabic speakers who live in that, or Greek speakers who live in Astoria. However, what we've discovered is that when you look at it poll site by poll site, some of those poll sites do not actually have quite as large concentrations as you see among the 101 sites that we did. I think what that means, really, the corollary, is as you go further and further down that list beyond 101 sites, if this project were to be expanded by the, com the Civic Engagement Commission in the future, you will see additional sites popping up on the list in places like Bay Ridge, in places like Astoria, um, Richmond Hill as well, um, other places where you see smaller concentrations in the individual poll sites, but larger concentrations in the sort of neighborhoods as a whole. So um, it, we, the metrics use the poll site, not the ADs or EDs, correct? That's correct. Wouldn't that be the more appropriate way in situations like this? Because if you're taking a, you know, poll sites have at times 10 yeah. uh, different uh, EDs that are connected to different assembly districts or different senatorial districts. And and that then divvies up. It's, it's kind of like, I'm not saying that this is what happened, I'm just saying it's like a gerrymandered language access program, right? If you're just using one all-encompassing uh, overview of it, it kind of like pushes aside the micro-communities that make the community whole, because not all the ADs, depending on where you're going, like for instance, I know one site that's at uh, Telecommunications High School. It, that school straddles two separate congressional districts, uh, two separate assembly districts, and has, uh, I think, one senatorial district, and then it has its own like very local Democratic and Republican county uh, seats that people can go and vote for, but it's spread out. So the, the, that spread is pretty big. It's on the border of, yeah. a, of two communities. Um, um, which both have a pretty significant Arab population um, who would need language access, but when you are encompassing the whole poll site, it doesn't reflect that because the way that it kind of the numbers don't look as viable because you're the, the communities are all split up at that point. If you go to a more centralized school where there is a higher, and I'm forgetting because uh, I'm not attuned with elementary schools, but there are some in the neighborhood where um, I would say four out of five voters are Arab speakers, and they still didn't have a translator either. Yeah, those are all helpful points, and I'm familiar with the same school that you're describing, the Telecommunications High School in Brooklyn. Um, there are, I think, a range of different approaches that could be taken to doing this project. The methodology that that we have used for this project in the pilot phase for pilot phase of this has been based on the uh, city board of elections process that is used. Um, the civic engagement commission's mandate. Um, 
um, is to develop a proposed methodology to be published at the beginning of 2020. Um, and so that's a process that you know we'll be supporting the commission and, and you all in developing. Um, the uh, the process really has been based on a desire to serve as broad a population as possible. And I think what you're putting your finger on are some of the tensions in trying to serve the largest population and also trying to be as sort of um, uh, tailored as possible to very local community needs, which I think is absolutely a desire of all of us and presumably of the commission as we go forward. Um, so I think it's a good topic for us to continue discussing as we're working through the proposed methodology, certainly. Um, I think, just to reiterate also, I think as we talk about further expansions, I think some of the difficulties that you've identified where you see a sort of cutoff at a certain number of sites um, due to operational constraints so far in the pilot phase, as you go further and you begin to look at expansions to the project, um, you'll see that more of the sites that you're describing, I think, will be covered, covered pole sites effectively. Um, but those are real, really helpful comments. Thank you. Hi, I'm sorry I was late um, because I was at the party and celebration for equality and equal pay. So um, I apologize, I missed some of your presentation. I'm a little interested in, um, we're talking about immigrant populations and English as a second language speakers. Um, we're now in a country where there is really a, a war against these people people, right? Um, so how is it going to work? I heard that you mentioned using census data. We're now going into a very, you know, difficult place with the census that may occur. Um, and that is a deterrent for people to come forward. We also have countries where when people register to vote or they're party affiliated, that has worked against them when there's disruption in their governments. So there's a fear by a lot of populations to register to vote. So I was wondering how that is also being looked at and what can be done to get people to the polls and to register to vote. Yeah, um, unfortunately our Democracy NYC <laughs> advisor left. Um, do you have, yeah. Um, that's a, I think it's an important question. It's something we've obviously thought about a great deal as well um, in, in this work and on the census work as well. Um, a couple of notes I think that we've thought about. One is that in the process that we do in order to identify the languages in the poll sites, um, we actually do make adjustments um, based on what, we, um, what we've understood from the sort of national literature on the undercount of non-citizens in the census data. Um, and so there's, uh, the model that we use um, does make adjustments based on undercount, based on historical data. Um, we have been in touch with researchers across the country just in the last few months um, to understand whether those models will need to be updated based on sort of changes to census methodology. Um, as you mentioned, um, things that are going on in Washington now. Um, so that's something that you know we'll be continuing to look at, whether an undercount needs to be adjusted. Um, the other, I think, important thing to mention is that the data that we use um, in order to make these um, estimates is based on the annual uh, sample census data called the American Community Survey. The American Community Survey does ask a question about citizenship um, in contrast to the decennial survey, the decennial census. Um, so what we're, what we're using is sample data that includes information about citizenship status, um, part, which is account, that accounts for part of the reason why we make that undercount adjustment because there is an understanding that there are some people who do not respond um, for that reason among others. Um, we um, have been very clear that we will continue to support uh, census outreach efforts to make sure that people are aware of the census um, and we want to make sure that people continue to respond. Um, so I think what you're raising is a very important consideration that there may be challenges in getting accurate data in some instances. Um, 
I think the two, the two strategies that we've employed, I think so far, which we'd like to continue to work on, are encouraging people to respond to the census and making sure that we can answer their questions about confidentiality issues that may arise. Um, and then also examining the data to make sure that we're capturing as accurate a picture as we can. Um, I think we'd also be interested in hearing more about um, instances in which um, we're, we may be identifying at the community level particular concerns about undercounts in particular neighborhoods. Other questions? I actually have another yeah, question. Yeah, um, <clears throat> my question is your process and how were you able to let the people know that this was available in at, at specific poll sites yeah. in their areas and things like really that. Really good question. So um, our strategy varied across elections, and, and you're right, it is so targeted, so doing kind of like a massive awareness campaign isn't necessarily the right approach. Um, for the November election, the general election in 2018, where we, when we were at 101 sites, we did some community and ethnic media um, ads. Um, we had flyers that we distributed to community-based organizations. Um, for, the, for the June election, we distributed flyers to um, community-based organizations on the day of we had um, some outreach staff um, stationed 101 feet outside of the poll sites distributing our flyer. So there were sort of various strategies we used, but I think that piece is, is, is a critical one um, in the subsequent elections. I actually also have a follow-up thought and question, which is that we know that legally people are allowed to take their own interpreters but that doesn't seem to be like widely known that you can bring for instance a family member or a friend in with you who's not a formally trained interpreter mm -hmm. so is that something that you in the past included in your um, public education efforts that piece of information is that something we need to be thinking about doing, you know, as a civic engagement commission to let people know yeah. about their voter rights, yeah. you know, and that that's one of their rights is that you can actually bring someone with you if you don't have a... Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point and question. Um, so, you know, there there is Know Your Rights info. Uh, the Campaign Finance Board puts out Know Your Rights info and we um, sort of compiled some of that, which includes that information and we've translated it into different languages. Um, but I think more can be done on raising awareness about that. We've also seen the Board of Elections not let family members go in mm -hmm. to help their family member in the process. So I do think that education is definitely critical. And there are times where we had poll monitors uh, who were just ensuring that in high immigrant communities, people were able to go in and have their voice heard at the ballot box. And when they went in with a, you know their daughter or their son or their grandkid, they were prohibited from assisting them um, and pretty much had to go in there blankly. Even if the poll monitor intervened and said you ha they should be allowed to do this, and then it just became a tussle. And then it's, it's a huge turnoff Absolutely. when you have to fight to allow someone to help you um, get to that point, which is why I was really excited that the city did launch the pilot program last year, because if that were to happen, it, it removes an hour argument of uh, with the poll site uh, person at the front desk, then the poll site manager, and then having to call the Board of Elections uh, legal team to kind of like lay the law with their folks, and that usually doesn't always happen. Yeah. So I think having like a backup plan yeah. for, um, you know, if you want to bring your own family member or friend to come and help you, you can actually bring anyone who's not affiliated with the campaign. Um, it doesn't just have to be a family member. Right. So I think that it, it's helpful as well if they're going to be obstructionists in, in this regard, having a city alternative. Absolutely. Any other questions, thoughts? Yeah, please. I 
think this is a quick question. Did, did you do any follow-up research to see if the participation of those particular groups increased as a result? Did he? I can speak to that a little bit. We have done some analysis on um, turnout rates in these elections. I think I think it, it has felt to us a little bit premature to make a conclusion about it and acknowledging that we've done this in a fairly limited fashion as part of this pilot project. Um, we are interested in continuing to look at that question. Um, one of the challenges that I'm sure many of you are aware is that the turnout rates in New York tend to vary a great deal election by election, especially when we're talking about some of these specials. Um, so it's, it is a little bit of a challenge without sort of a baseline of participation by limited English proficient voters. Um, but I think we'd be very open to talking more about sort of different ways of evaluating that. We've also done some evaluation internally um, to get qualitative information from the, pol from the interpreters and our supervisors, um, which has helped to inform the way that we've, we've uh, we've launched a project and we continue to. Um, I think uh, coming from Staten Island, I think um, a major problem there is the communication. Um, for me, uh, speaking to people about the having a translator there or no one knows about it. So of course, not to be repetitive, but to get that information out, whether it's handing out flyers at your local civics for each town, or even for the schools where you have a lot of um, people with English as a second language, to see that flyer come home in their child's backpack to know that it's safe to go vote and they can go vote and there will be a translator there. So I think that's a major problem. Yeah, and I think your point um, of sort of leveraging the schools, even the existing polling sites, who are which are senior centers, civic groups, nonprofits, they can be great channels for getting the word out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, no, absolutely. The people who are there, it's like preaching to the choir. Yeah. They know they're there, they know they have a translator, but... Yep, there needs to be a drumbeat. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. Great. Um, so for the next um, part, the, the rest of this meeting will just be going over commission business. So I want to turn back to the, reviewing the minutes from the last meeting. Um, so you should have had gotten a copy of the minutes. Um, so if you could just look it over, it's in large font. We, we had an accessible version up online. We have an accessible version, a PDF version. So if you could just look it over uh, and see if you have any additions or corrections to the minutes. It's very basic. We did have a formal resolution to vote on, so. Um, Oh, it's right here. Mm. <laughs> Very basic, skeletal. So Mo so motion to approve? Yeah. Okay. So motion to approve, did I, sorry, did I hear a second? Yeah, I Okay, you second, okay, great. Uh, so all in favor? Or Aye. Aye. Anyone opposing? I do actually have a question though. Okay. Um, uh, is there a reason why we don't uh, share more of the content of the meeting? Um, that's a really good question. My understanding is, from a legal standpoint, we're obligated to share when there's a vote on a resolution. I, that, so, we're, so we're doing sort of what is required legally. I just think that like, um, uh, but you're, you're concerned about sort of this, the substance. But Annetta, remember we're being recorded, it's all archived, so anyone can go back and see the entire meeting. And I think the minutes then are really, as I understand it, parliamentary in that you only record the votes in this manner for the minutes. Yeah, it's just, it's just the following the... Um, I guess my 
question is so beyond the, uh, the parliamentary procedures. Um, since it uh, seems that you know folks can't make every meeting, I'm just thinking purely from a self interest perspective. <laughs> what is it? Well, I mean, on on I which to get all of the. I mean, I suppose I'm going to have a conversation I mean, with you. But yes. Things, like, track. I mean, I I, I go and look for the reporting. Um, just the highlights of like what was discussed. Yeah, I mean, there is there is the recording. They are live streamed. There's also a transcript that we'll put up. Um, and I so I encourage people to read that. And also, I encourage people to stay in touch with each other, right? Like you have your, and also be in touch with me so that we can try to keep everyone on the same page. Um, I think that the ability to watch the meeting online if you can't make it or watch a video of it later is that's pretty amazing. I mean, you don't necessarily want to watch a two-hour meeting. <laughs> it might not be so exciting, but if you know, just as a way to keep up when necessary, it could be it could be helpful. Uh, so okay, so if there are no uh, changes and we we motioned and seconded, will the minutes are approved? Um, Yes. Oh, you're going to abstain. Okay. Okay. Um, so we'll make sure that we record that. Um, okay. Um, so, um, all right. I have a couple of updates for you um, before we get into a little bit more of a conversation. One thing I wanted to check in is everyone should have received an email with their civic engagement email address. Just want to make sure you got it and you are all into your emails because I want to start using the emails. So some people still aren't. Um, is that because of something we need to do to help you or is it because of something you need to do? <laughs> Oh yeah, my password expired also, so I was on the technical assistance line, but it didn't get resolved yesterday. Okay. And I never got the email. You never got the email? With, with the password. With the password. Well, they wouldn't give it to you. They wouldn't give you the... You, no one received an email with the password. What you received is an email that had your email address, your um, login ID, and a phone number to call for who's going to give you the password. You didn't get it. All right, let's talk after. Um, but everyone else was able to get it. Okay. So I'm not. I'm not in. Sorry, I'm not in. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll confirm. I, I've been uh, with spotty reception. I've been out of town on vacation. Okay. I actually took a vacation. So, so once, once I have assurance that everyone is on these emails, then I will start using that. But until that time, I will continue to use your personal emails. Um, also, as you know, I text you as well because I'm not sure how frequently you're accessing emails. So I like to do both things. I hope you don't mind getting texts from me at um, hours of the night. I just wanted to confirm I got the email, um, but I'll confirm with you at a later time. I ha haven't actually been able to try to get in, but I did get the email you're referring to. So I'll let you know if I have any issues okay. and confirm when, when I've actually tried it, which I should be able to do right after this meeting. So. Okay. Thank they you. Are, they are very helpful when you call. Oh. Okay. Yeah. If if you have any issues, always feel free to reach out. If they're not, if you're not receiving what you want or need. Um, last meeting, we also talked about trying to create a standardized deck, a PowerPoint that people could use um, to, if they're out there making presentations. So we did develop that, and it's sort of it's right now being. Uh, will be looked at and approved internally before we publicize it. So I just want to let you know that. Um, we also talked about developing some bylaws for the commission. The law department has been working on that. I'm going to be con uh, organizing a call with the people who said they'd be willing to help, like the subgroup. So I think that's Donna and Mark Diller. So we'll do a call with the law department to look at it, and then we can um, bring it to the full meeting once you know we 
sure to go over it uh, separately beforehand. Um, something we didn't talk about last time, which I wanted to, was the social media for the commission. Right now, the commission is not on Facebook, is not on Twitter, is not on Instagram, and I'm assuming that we all want that to happen. Um, what I do want to get your input and thoughts on are what kind, what kind of content do we want on there, right? So I just wanted to get a few ideas here, and of course you're always welcome to add more ideas as we go along, but um, what, should, what should we share on social media is kind of what I want to ask you today. Well, hopefully we're gonna do something and we can share that. <laughs> something. <laughs> I also think to start is maybe uh, our purpose so others know what our purpose is. If we're inviting other people onto that page. Okay. Seems like we should definitely use it to advertise the listening sessions. Mm -hmm. And the hearings. Yeah. I, th I think we want to be careful to have it be um, curated because I think we want to be, we want to use it thoughtfully for all the reasons that were just mentioned, but um, because we want it to be a kind of a sort of um, trusted place. Yes. And of course having lang language accessibility. Uh, what does uh, that mean? Just if a flyer is going to say there's a meeting and there's a listening session happening that that listening session, wherever it's located, has the top languages of that area. I think we could also obviously use it to remind the public as um, our meetings um, get closer that they're happening so more of the public have the ability to attend the meetings if they're able to and would like to so we could use it to just notify the public of things that are uh, coming up including the meetings themselves. Yes. I also feel the, that the admin should uh, look over to see if any inappropriate comments, which I think normally happens, and just weed those uh, individuals out also. If, I, again, if the public is going to have access to that. Because I've been on other Facebook pages or uh, other sites where it's open to the public and you always get those negative comments or argumentative people. So I think it should be a general place, like she said, for people to feel safe to, to come and question what we're doing and what our purpose is. So just monitoring sort of the yes. replies on Facebook yes. and Twitter and right. keeping track and um, if there is somebody who is out of line to consider blocking. I think it's gonna be really important too to have an outreach strategy. I mean, we're talking about getting to different community groups. Um, I think it's gonna be really important in the social media strategy to make sure that we friend or follow mutually because they will help to push the, our message out. Is there, is there any assistance available to us from the city in terms of like a, a more of a general social media and marketing plan, communication plan? Um, well, the Civic Engagement Commission will have a comms person who will be coordinating with other, you know, efforts around the city and also with the mayor's office and other initiatives, so yeah. Other thoughts on Donna? I think all of those are <clears throat> excellent choices, but I also think that we need to put some of the information about the work that we're doing, like participatory budget is starting. Um, so we need to inform the public about that process and what's going on and um, because if people are looking on the page, they need to know that things are happening and we're just not, you know, stagnant and, and just being social and yeah. having conversations. So it's, so it's about, it's amplifying our own initiatives but also um, amplifying other initiatives that are related to the work that we're supposed, that to, we're supposed to be doing. Absolutely. Okay. Other thoughts? Yeah. Um, 
Okay. So, I mean, so this is, again, this is like a topic of ongoing conversation. And I mean, something that I like to share sometimes on my own social media is like stuff that motivates people to get civically engaged. So there might be like a great article you read or a great, someone has a great story. One thing I would actually love to do at some point is to make a video of each of you talking about what animates you about civic engagement like not just need to be like an hour but just like a snippet right and we could feature that because we want to engage New Yorkers and show people like the diversity of commissioners the kind of work that you're doing you know all of that so I'd love to sort of work on that kind of project and then we can have other people not just commissioners but other people featured on you know in that kind of format as well <coughs> Okay, awesome. Um, the next thing on the agenda, where is just, oh, turn it over, okay. Um, the listening session. So we had started talking about this, and you also have in your folder a pack, uh, a sheet of paper that says, Thank you. draft for, you have it. Listening sessions proposal. Um, we talked a little bit about the goals last time, right? We talked about the educate, educate New Yorkers, about CEC, collect ideas for what we'd like to see from the public, engage the public in civic participation, motivate people, inspire people to become more civically engaged. The rest of this document, I sort of tried to put together some thoughts on possible timeline, possible structure, um, some questions. I thought these um, this could be an opportunity for people to submit short testimonies, two to three minutes, answering one of the questions that I put here, and there are different kinds of questions. One type of question is like specifically asking their input on participatory budgeting, language access, community boards, right? What have their experiences been? What could they, what would they do? Ideas for what they would do to strengthen work in those areas. The other type of question is just like what motivates them, gets them excited um, to get involved. So there are questions like, um, you know, what issues of civic engagement should the CEC prioritize, right? How can New York City be a model for civic engagement? How can New York City serve the people of the city and the world with more civic engagement, right? So just like trying to get more vision, right? And asking even how, like, have you ever had a moment that felt really amazing in terms of civic engagement? What did it feel like, right? So having people share their own stories. Those are some thoughts of the kinds of questions we could ask. Um, and also part of this is to develop, as we've been talking about, a good outreach plan. So we know we're trying to get to different communities. Also leading up, we should have a longer time of outreach, not do a you know listening session like, and then try to advertise it a week before. We should have a couple of weeks of outreach. Um, also thought it would be good to have some kind of survey online and at, at the listening session, like very few questions, but to keep track of who's kind of walking into the room. Um, what I wanted to get your thoughts on today is really the, the second item that's on this draft, which is the timeline. Um, I was just put down, again, this is a draft and open to input, right? My thought was that if we did the listening sessions in the fall, this could be an, in sort of more in a shorter time span, like from September to November, right? across five boroughs. This is like sort of just jumping right in and giving people across the city an intro to the commission. There are trade-offs in trying to condense everything into a short time frame. So is that a good way to go or do we want to try to do one every month, take a little longer from like September to January? You know, it, 
I'm just wondering about your thoughts on that. Um, and also, we had talked before about how if we did one in each borough, it's going to be tough to reach people across the borough, right? It's hard to find a central location in each borough. So do we need to do more than five? So I would just, again, love to you know, have your thoughts on, on how we move forward. And one thing I would like to do uh, when we walk before we leave here is to have a date for the first one. Even if we haven't decided about all the other ones, I'd like to do, have a date for the first. So thoughts on, on time frame? I like the September to November. Um, a lot of the holidays fall a little later this year, so you have some availability in September, which we don't often have. You will have some, not so much in October this year. Um, so just to take that in, in consideration, but I think it's a good way of going September through November. I, I have a, um, a few thoughts that might help us um, might help inform the discussion around the timeline. Um, you know, as I sort of uh, uh, look at the questions and what we want to achieve from these listening sessions, I just um, think about how do we do this and what would pull these good, you know, good ideas <laughs> out of people. I, I really would um, uh, encourage us to be um, really creative and thoughtful, so it's not like this boring panel of people sitting down, listening to, and putting people, community members, who are not used to speaking. If we want to truly hear from the, the, the folks who are invisible, unheard, um, I think we need to think about uh, different formats that is, that's inclusive, um, culturally inclusive, that's creative, that may involve art, um, interaction, um, more, a sort of more dynamic uh, experience um, that then sort of spreads like wildfire across the city where people are anticipating and looking forward to it. Yeah. Sounds, you have me sold. What do so, we need to do? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, I'm having those sort of coming off the... The Charter Revision Commission. Where it's like, you hear really the, the people who whose ideas you're already preaching to the choir, right? right. Like, um, who have all the resources and all the, so <clears throat> I think that before we start thinking about the timeline, we need to really invest some energy in thinking through what is the experience we want. Yeah. Um, That's a great, great and, uh And I think it's going to take some resources. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to take, um, I would love to quit my job and you know, do a <laughs> creative art project with the community. It's not possible. So I don't think it's possible <laughs> for any of us here. So I would love for us to consider um, hiring people who do this, who do community. Because what we're talking about is community visioning sessions, right? Um, and, and I'm sure we all know folks who can sort of throw ideas into that about who can do this. Um, and to do something like that, it takes some planning. It takes, um, it takes planning in terms of identifying where, mm -hmm. location, mm -hmm. that is accessible. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think we will need to do some like deep sort of groundwork, and that's where we can each play a role in identifying people who can be champions mm -hmm. to get the stuff going and spread the word. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to take some, some, some I think funding, funding for materials, for space, um, people, staff, staff. Um, uh, these events are most successful if there's food. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I think um, it's how we open up people's minds and get them more connected. Um, so, this is something. So, my, my question about that, I love that. Um, I love art and I, I, it would be great to include that. I'm wondering if you are saying we should stay away from the testimony format, or are you saying include that too, or both? Both is it I both think, and or? I think that I think we should stay with. I guess if, if I have to choose, yes, I would stay away from the testimony format. Do you um, think that formal format have it more of a 
interactive? Yes. I think interactive, I think giving each individual the comfort to be able to express their ideas is what we would go for. I think if we're truly about including everyone and hearing from the folks we never hear from. Preaching to the to the choir because I've been involved in so many different whether it's a PTA or even just my local civic association. You know, being vice president there, it was always the same handful of people coming. How do we? You know, we did door to door flyers. You know, Staten Island is their own little animal. We're very extremely extremely diversified, and as the days go by, we are more and more diversified, which is great. But it's getting that outreach to get the people to come and see what we're doing and you know how passionate we are and getting them to be just as passionate to be civic minded um, I think that is is the problem and I agree no one wants to come and sit you know in rows of, of uh, chairs to listen to us speak so and to get the Staten Islanders to come to the city for the meetings or coming to Brooklyn or Queens is extremely difficult. We're doing one in Staten Island. Oh, we are. Yes. Oh, okay. We multiple in every. Yeah, borough. exactly, exactly. And it should be neighborhood focused. Absolutely. I or borough. I mean, we're of course our borough is much smaller than Manhattan and Brooklyn, but it's it's just its own different animal. And I can only speak because I'm living there for 29 years. Originally from Brooklyn, but it's just a complete different. Different, different animal. Well, our first thing to do too is what we do. What what are we set out to do? And we have to be very clear about that. And I think to use a word, we have to be a little sexy. You know, we have it, rather than being very stoic about well, we have three mandates and we're to do X, Y, and Z. And people are like, well, I'm already asleep. Right. And uh, or how are you going to do that? Right. So we need to. I like like your rebranding of a listening tour. I've had a problem with just calling them listening tours, which sound like people come, we listen, and then we move on, which I think we need to really put out there that it's a much more active, engaged process where they come, they speak, we listen, we do something with that, we turn it around. I mean, this is going to have to be a very robust uh, system by which you take in and put back out, take in again and put back out. Um, so I think the staff and some resources, so how we're going to do that. You, you framed it as community visioning. I think that's where it starts. Different than listening. Or community but conversation. Yeah. I think, conversation. I think I agree with Annetta's recommendation. <laughs> like, no one wants to come to, especially the communities that we're trying to enfranchise and bolster. I don't, I don't see that being something that is going to be of interest and, quite frankly, would be very hard to do outreach for. Um, so I do agree that we should have a different model than a normal hearing setup. Okay. Um, I, I think that with the community conversation setup, we can still get the testimony we need. I don't think that we're negating that either, which, which will give us help in figuring out where do the areas that we should be looking at sooner rather than later, I'm assuming, is why we want to do some of these conversations. Um, Se secondly, I think that the, the this just shouldn't be the Civic Engagement Commission. Like we're going into communities, there are organizations and communities that have been doing this work and have been talking to themselves for the most part, right? Exactly. And they've been organizing and bringing people to do this work with them. I think we have to definitely have a partnership model for this. Um, and in that, if there isn't any money, then we can uh, figure out how we can share the burden of. Um, um, the conversation, meeting, whatever it is we're calling it, um, so that we can actually have the most impactful and have the people who Lori is uh, mentioning who don't show up, show up. Um, I think in South Brooklyn, there should be one if it's not listed already. Um, 
and I think that the two two of the biggest immigrant populations uh, who are impacted are in South Southwest Brooklyn. Um, and we should definitely be looking in that region for something where it can potentially be in. We have a, it's a huge Latino community, Arab community, Chinese community. Uh, you know, it's it's a very diverse uh, area of the borough, and I think that I wouldn't. I would if we had to do one. Um, I wouldn't recommend that, but if we did, we'd have to have a, a, a pretty big space with language access and translation services and ensuring that we're being as culturally sensitive and competent as possible in how we roll out whatever it is we do. And if we do separate ones, we would open it up to everyone in the community, but have a more targeted approach of the outreach that we're doing. So we can maybe potentially have one that's for Spanish-speaking folks, one for Arabic-speaking folks, one for Chinese-speaking folks. Uh, I think to add on to what Murad is saying, I think one of the ways we can do that is to, one of the ways we can collaborate, so I agree with the point that I want to uh, piggyback on or add to is what he was saying about collaborating with um, community-based organizations, and, and one of the specific ways we can maybe think about doing that is identifying events that are happening uh, in in a particular area of a borough or community that we could maybe tack on to that event and become part of that event to inform um, instead of doing always something separate like an example of an event like that like this even though it's past for our community the disabled community one of the biggest uh, nonprofit organizations in the city called Young Adult Institute in the summer does uh, the Central Park Challenge where they bring where like thousands of people from our community come to Central Park and there's entertainment and there's there are a bunch of booths and so if we could uh, an upcoming event in, it's obviously going to be too soon I think to do this but like the Disability Pride Parade for example is this weekend another example of an event it, that happens in the spring for the Irish community and the LGBTQ plus community is the St. Pat's for All inclusive parade that was started like 16, 17 years ago before the LGBTQ community could march down Fifth Avenue. So if we wanted to do something in the spring in Queens, maybe we could collaborate with the St. Pat's for All Parade because young people come to that, there's entertainment, and you're reaching a lot of people. They already have a truck, loudspeakers, you know, so many Maybe identify events like that that we could become a part of that are already existing to reach people. And I have an opportunity this weekend on <laughs> Saturday, the annual Chatpati Mela in Jackson Heights. Oh, right. 10,000 people show up to that. You're welcome to, Enjoy. we are welcome to have a booth. <laughs> that's great, that's really great. I mean, I think that's definitely the case. We have to sort of work with events that are already happening and which definitely like maybe I can, we can start like a calendar of those kinds of opportunities that people can, that you all know about, that you can, you know, we can compile that together. Again, I think social media, again, I think would be great where it's a place we can all go and see what's going on. Yeah, so what I, what I am hearing now is that you, does anybody want a traditional hearing model for the listening sessions? It sounds, so it sounds to me like you, you want to go down a different path. Well, it's absolutely fine. Yeah, go ahead. So one thing I do want to bring up, because I like the idea of being creative, and I always think we have to be creative in terms of how we're going to tackle different issues. But at the same time, when I th uh, the more practical side of me <laughs> is thinking about our community. I almost think there's two separate things we need to keep in mind, which is one, yes, we want to make it interesting for people who are there, who show up, and how do we get thoughtful feedback. But then my when I think about the steps before that of how we're going to 
get people there. I think the issue sometimes that we have with our community um, is why they should even care about being civically engaged. And I think that for me is the bigger challenge is that um, just this is like a small, somewhat related, but not related analogy, like comparison. But like, you know, our organization, we have a lot of first gen Koreans that are staff, right? And so we went through this whole process of going through a strategic plan and thinking about, hey, are our services, are they still relevant? Is our community still relevant that we're trying to target? Um, and just to even wrap their minds around, well, because they're thinking, well, let's just do the work. Like, why are we talking so much about this? Let's just do it, right? And so for me to try to get change their mindset of why this is important and how we need to make sure that that North Star guiding light is still the direction we need to go in, it took more than two years for me to get to that point to convince my staff, right? And so when I sort of think of it in that sense, um, I think folks know that it's important to vote, but then to get them a step further to register them and then also get feedback on how to get them to that place where they are going to be more engaged is sort of where I'm... So, uh, sorry, I'm just thinking out loud. Because um, I think there is a challenge in terms of how to even do the initial groundwork of why it's important to be civically engaged and then to get them, like when I'm thinking about those folks and try to get them to these events, I mean, it could be that if it is more creative, they'll have more turnout, right? But then um, I'm just trying to think of also the work that has to happen before that, where we need to, and maybe it can happen simultaneously on two different tracks, but really using social media to talk about the commission, the purpose of it, which I think is important to make sure we have that message clear and why we, you know, almost drill it into their minds before these listening events happen. So I don't know timeline wise how that would work, but, you know, just to throw it out there. I appreciate that. Um, uh, I just want to go back to this um, point that folks raised about partnering with um, local groups, and not just um, nonprofits, but also religious institutions, because that's that's where the people are. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, perhaps uh, th this addresses your concern, Linda, but I think, um, you know, really doing some advanced planning and engaging yeah. work with those local uh, institutions, mm -hmm. I think if we have their buy-in, their support, their kind of championing of this idea, I think that that, I, I think a lot of the disconnected communities really look to um, the green light, to get the green light from their religious institutions and from these local CBOs that they may have a relationship with. So I think if those entities are promoting these sessions, I think that's that's our best strategy for addressing some of this like, well, I don't know what this, why should I believe in this? Um, and what is this? And I, I also would argue that <clears throat> This idea that I'm proposing about going a more creative, engaging route actually gets to that mm -hmm. problem. Because I think if we just say, let's have this hearing about civic engagement and how you can get involved and how the power really belongs to you, I'm sorry, that's a sleeper. I can't see the community I or right. turning out for that. But I think if we say, hey, come to this fun event planned in Richmond Hill on September 23rd, there'll be food, there'll be, you know, hear from folks about this, this new idea that is, you know, sort of bubbling up or whatever, however we want to frame it, that's more interesting, uh, where there are local stakeholders who are championing and promoting that event, I think we then stand a chance to at least get people to pass by, put their little idea on the wall and leave. I also think I also think in terms of the messaging piece, it might be helpful. Sorry, I'm just thinking for the pre-work that has to happen. Like for example, we, we partner a lot with the churches in the community because you know, there's tons of Korean churches out there in Flushing. There's like so many. But, you know, we partner with them and we have a lot of high attendance rates, obviously, for something around free screenings for diabetes, which is something that we do, or even getting their buy-in to help us with mental health destigmatization of, of that issue. But, you know, so maybe it's even in terms of thinking of different issue areas that they can relate to a little bit more. Like, for example, 
everyone appreciates getting free healthcare screenings, but like how, how is that related to what we're doing? Well, you know, depending on if you're registered to vote, who you vote for, that informs policies that will directly impact if we can provide these services or not and whether we get funding to do it, right? So maybe even, even in the messaging and not just the actual event, just thinking of different snippets where um, we can use, whether it's healthcare, whether, you know, whatever um, issue areas are important to our communities, uh, relating it back to why it's important to get involved in this process. I think that's really key, Linda. I like that a lot. It's really about um, a, a civic process and explaining that to people that you can make a difference. I think so many people are not engaged because what difference does it make? I'm just going to vote in the same person who everybody's been voting for and I don't see any change and I can't affect change in the city. And what we're saying is that you can affect change. So I think what we have to do, and Annette, you have a great uh, way of doing that, is we need some sort of creative civic uh, lesson that goes out, right, where it's, I don't know, play acted or participatory in some way to really start to do like, well, if you hand me this problem, diabetes, what do I do? Well, we have to go to the community. We need, you know, medical people to come in and talk to us. We need statistics. We need, and some, you know, there is an organization, at least one, if not more, who know how to put these things together. So I think if we go out with, with that sort of program, it will really, I think, energize and excite people to start to get more involved, at least come out for these, and then what is the next step? Uh, I'm so sorry, but play acting, because actually this is a um, this is a, a, a an approach that's used and that's been very effective in um, in developing countries. Theater of the oppressed. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, okay. Just to try to yeah. keep us on time, someone, Eve. Yeah, I have, I have some thoughts that I, yeah. I just want to throw out here. Um, because, I mean, it's really exciting to think about developing something new, you know, from scratch that is focused on civic engagement. And I think, you know, we have a chance to, to pitch this as like co-creation of this new entity, you know, with the people that we're trying to reach. Um, and, you know, to your point, Linda, I, I hear what you're, what you're saying. I think it's important. Um, but I also think it's our responsibility to kind of pitch civic engagement in a different way that it's it's not just voting right I mean you know people people attending a local religious service that's that's a form of civic engagement really you know like talking to your neighbors there's all different ways of civically engaging so I think we have to be very clear about that messaging that we're trying to open up a lot of forms um, the partnership ideas that have been thrown out here I think are, are terrific um, but I do want to just keep an eye on making sure that we have like a methodology for covering the city in the way that we need to and that we're we're not merely guided by kind of like an ad hoc response to whatever event is available that we we have to make sure that you know we are um, covering the city I'm not sure if we want to break it down by demographics or ethnic ethnicity or region or, or what but um, and then the last point I just wanted to make was something in response to what Murad had said about um, having different events for different people I think that's important, you know, for groups to have a, a sense of trust internally, but I also think that, think that there's great value in different, you know, constituencies being together to talk about civic engagement, you know, so. Yeah. I think bottom line is educating people, and by educating them is communicating. I mean, I'm embarrassed to even say that I never even heard of participatory budget before I got to my first meeting here. Never, never heard of it. I think a lot of people in New York City haven't heard of it. Uh, I, I mean, to see people raise their hands, I was like, ooh, I don't, I don't even know what that, you know, I didn't know what that was before I spoke to you. Yeah. So I think okay. I've heard an expression recently about our work here, which I think is relevant, which is that we are trying to fly a plane that we're trying to build at the same time. <laughs> So there's a lot of really, I mean, I, I agree that we want to take a new and creative approach. Um, 
one of the things I want to put out there is that when we are doing something like that, new, creative, hasn't been tried before, um, we want to take time to have people you know, get involved, get engaged more, communicate more. That takes more time. So that's always a trade-off, right? So like the desire to see results in a short amount of time, which is something that the public imposes on a governmental entity because they want to see that they're that we're doing work. There's a there's a tension between that and wanting to have a process that takes more time and is more creative. So I just want to name that tension. Um, I don't think we need to resolve today the timeline, but I'm, what I'm hearing is that you want to take a more thoughtful approach to these listening sessions, um, so we can we can take the time to think about it a little bit more. Um, I still would like to try to do one of them in September just to sort of kick it off and maybe this is even a process that is ongoing as opposed to like a listening tour that happens and stops, but it's something that we continue, that part of the Civic Engagement Commission's work is to have these kinds of ongoing spaces. We create these spaces where people come to talk about different civic engagement issues, you know, Oh, and, that, and we don't stop, right? So maybe that's, some, that's something else to think about. And oh. Sarah, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to understand why we're so siloed, why we're trying to build an airplane and fly it at the same time when we're in a city government that has all kinds of experts and people who have done great things before, so why are we trying to reinvent the wheel or build the first airplane? I feel like we're missing an opportunity to tap into a lot of resources, and I don't know exactly how to do that, but I would urge that we start looking at that. Yeah, I mean, we have we have existing convers standing conversations now that are trying to coordinate the civic engagement initiatives that are in the city. So Democracy NYC, for instance, or um, the Census um, Public Engagement Unit, we're actually talking to each other to see how we can work better together, and also we need to start having conversations with community organizations as well. I think what I was just referring to is that it, we're going to have to put some kind of format together yeah. to engage the public, right? And I was trying to suggest that we don't need to have all the answers for how we do it, but that we sort of learn as we do, do it and learn as we're going along. I think you know. one other thing that I would just bump up and piggyback off of um, something Amy said was we have um, – the public engagement unit for the mayor's office, as well as the public engagement unit at the council. Mm -hmm. um, we also have partners like parts the participatory budgeting uh, project. Like there are a number of different people who have like mastered the way of doing these community conversations. Yeah. We really don't have to reinvent the wheel, and we can definitely just tap in. And I know that. Money is always an issue, but we can figure that out. And in the interim, just see what's going to work for the areas of uh, the city that we're trying to have these conversations in. Okay. So I think my homework is to do a little bit more exploring with community partners and with all of you and with this subgroup that was working on the listening sessions to try to figure out, like, what our next step is on this. So I'm going to I'm going to stop the conversation on this topic. We have about 5 minutes left. We won't have time to really get into the two other handouts that I handed you, but I want to just say a couple of things about them. Um, the two other documents that I gave you are draft docu documents again. Um, your homework will be to review these documents and provide your thoughts on what is put on the paper on paper here. One is a document uh, about the participatory budgeting advisory committee. Another is a document about the language access advisory committee. As you know, both of these committees are are mandates of the charter that the Civic Engagement Commission must 
form these committees, right? So um, I'm also, we are having you know, conversations internally with operations, with the appointments office, with the mayor's office, just about how these committees will look. Um, but in these drafts is sort of an overview of what the responsibilities are of these committees and some of the criteria that can be used to select people who will sit on these committees. A lot of what's on this paper is drawn from the charter and what it is expecting us to do. I've also looked a little bit at um, suggestions, for example, from participatory budgeting project. Um, the city council has some, um, has its own citywide PB committee. So there are different ways that people have approached this work and we're trying to sort of draw on those approaches um, to see, you know, to accomplish our goal. But I would love for you to, again, look through these and, and you know, we can keep the conversation going about this. Um, this work is also time bound, right? We need to develop a proposed methodology for language access um, at poll sites by January of 2020. That means that we need to formulate an advisory board fairly quickly so that they can help and be a part of that process of creating the methodology, right? Um, for participatory budgeting as well, um, the city council is starting its PB process, like now. Um, they have a citywide committee, right? Um, we've got to figure out how we're going to work with that process. Um, we're accountable to have a citywide PB process in place by July or June of next year, 2020. So again, we want to have an advisory committee that's, you know, going to be formed and up and running to inform that process as well. So um, I'm going to be talking internally about developing a proper timeline for implementing all of this in an efficient way. Um, so we will continue to talk about that. Do, do you want to have a meeting in August? August is a travel, you know, like people go away, so I don't know. Hmm? I think we have to. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people go away, so I think mid-August is that there's some holidays uh, also Maybe during that if time. the subcommittee can meet in August, and then... The listening sessions? Yeah. Okay. And then in September, come back with the report back, and like maybe two options of what we can do moving forward. Yeah. And then being we able to do that to kick off this uh, fall. The fall session, yeah. We can also, if you're not, if you're, if people are away, we can try to do the listening session subgroup meeting, like still in July. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Could we have the ability to call into that? Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, okay. So, it is now the hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, for us to close, are there any other issues that we need to raise at this meeting? Anything that you, in addition to the listening sessions, will continue to talk about um, participatory budgeting and language access. We also need to do a presentation on community boards because that's another area of work, so we'll try to build that on. Um, so if there's nothing else to discuss I today. I have a question. Yeah. I was wondering if, oh if you could share with us the current capacity of your office. The capacity of the office, meaning the staff? Yeah. The, yeah, the current capacity is me. <laughs> and it's LA who's interning with me till the end of July. Um, we have been interviewing people to fill the six additional lines we have. Um, those interviews hopefully will lead to a finalized pool of candidates that we can start to, you know, onboard. Um, Certainly hoping to onboard at least one other person, like in the next couple of weeks, but maybe more. Um, but we want to we want to make sure that we have staff by September. Certainly. 
Uh, it just it's just takes time to find good people and also just to navigate the process of you know applying and all of that just from a city standpoint yeah I, I mean I, I think um, we could probably help you with some of that uh, and if I can share with us yes of course yes we will do that yeah yeah they're basically I mean just to give you very quick over there's an advisor for participatory budgeting, advisor for language access, there's a communications role, a, co a community outreach role, a sort of an admin role, and then we need to have someone who's operations, like chief of staff and a lawyer, and that's all combined into one. So I'm trying to work out how we get sort of multiple functions into single roles, and that's been one of the tensions, and I know that people who've run organizations understand this very well. Yeah, we were smiling at each other. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly, um, which, which also makes it tough to align with civil service titles, because those are sort of tend to focus on one task uh, or one type of job. Okay, so um, Donna? Oh, yeah. So cards, are we gonna get cards? That was my question. Business and cards? Business cards, yeah. Okay, I look and, into that. And um, what was my other question? I forgot the other question I was waiting for. The business cards, definitely. And I just lost it. Okay, if you, I mean, you, we can yeah, always, I'll, I'll yeah, call you. be in touch. Um, so do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Yes. Make a motion. Mm -hmm. Make a motion. Yes, second. Okay, so the motion to adjourn has been seconded. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Great, the motion's passed, and we're gonna call this meeting oh, to adjourn. We, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh -oh. <laughs> we do not have a date for the next meeting is over. I'm so sorry. Yeah. The talking points you said you were having you was having so the deck. The standardized deck. Right. So we that, can share I can share that. that. When is that gonna be getting? So um that. it should be ready within the next week or that so. Was over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it should be ready within the next week. So we can I can share that out. Okay, um the, we don't have a date for the next meeting, but I will work on that with you okay. online. Okay, thank you very much um, for being you. here. Thank you.